Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Kang, Minister of Citizen Services and Minister Responsible for Multiculturalism. Today, I'm at my constituency office in Burnaby on the territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I am very grateful to be able to live with Indigenous communities who have been here since time immemorial and whose culture and traditions enrich our communities. I know many of you are joining us today from other territories throughout this province, and I'd like to acknowledge the fundamental Indigenous history of our province. I am a daughter to Taiwanese immigrants. The Mandarin name given to me is Kang An Li, which means health, peace, and gift. I treasure the name my parents have given me because it is their wish that their daughter is given the gift of good health and peace. I also hope during this unprecedented time of COVID-19 that everyone stay healthy and have the peace in their hearts and communities as everyone deserves. So with that, thank you so much for joining us for this virtual town hall meeting on anti-racism. On the panel are individuals who are all strong advocates for racial equity and equality. They each bring a wealth of experience and insight to the issues of racism and hate. They are Patricia Borkaskas. Patricia serves on the BC Multicultural Advisory Council and the Minister's Advisory Council on Indigenous Women. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you very next, much. Thank you. And the next speaker we have on our panel is Dr. Ismael Traore. Dr. Ismael uh, is a, also a member of the BC Multicultural Advisory Council and someone who we look to uh, to be a great advocate for the multicultural community. Welcome, Dr. Ismail. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And next, I have a good friend and my colleague, the Parliamentary Secretary, Ravi Kalan, who is also the MLA for Delta North and the Parliamentary Secretary for Forest, Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and Rural Development. Welcome, Ravi. Thank you, Minister. And as well, we have our ASL translator, Nigel Howard. Welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're able to join us today for this very important discussion. It's going to be a very thoughtful discussion for all of us. Racism is top of mind for all of us. And over the past weeks and months, we have witnessed horrific acts of racism. At the same time, I think we are also witnessing moments of hope as discussions on how to dismantle racism have taken on new urgency. The harsh reality is that many in our community face racial discrimination as part of their daily lives. This town hall on racism is an opportunity to have open dialogue on how we all can work together to defend our multicultural heritage and fight racism, hate and discrimination. We want to talk about how we can address both individual acts of racism and systemic racism, the policies, the procedures and behaviors that create disadvantages for racialized people. I want to acknowledge the impacts and trauma that racism have caused for far too many people and that today's conversation could be triggered and could be difficult for some people. Supports that are available um, are um, services such as Victim Link BC at 1-800-563-0808. And one more time, it is Victim Link BC at 1 800 563 0808. So, this will be a valuable resource for anyone. Uh, please do reach out if you or someone you know is in need of these services. So, before we begin, I want to give a quick overview of the next hour of our virtual town hall, um, how it will go, and then we'll go, we'll get straight to these questions. Um, Patricia Barcascas will start us, start us off with some brief remarks, and next we will hear from Dr. Ismail Traore and then Parliamentary Secretary Ravi Kalan before we take questions. For those of you who have a question and were unable to submit it ahead of time, you can ask it in the comments section of the live event here on Facebook. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Patricia Barkaska. Please, Patricia. Thank you, Minister. 
It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about um, what is obviously a difficult topic uh, for everyone, um, but especially, of course, for those who are affected by the, the racism that we see taking place today and which has historical roots in the place we now call Canada. Um, I would like to begin by also acknowledging the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh people, because that's the territory that I'm on here in Vancouver today. And as a Métis person from Alberta, I want to acknowledge that I am an uninvited guest on these territories. Um, and I always am thinking about that as I, I endeavor into the work that I do as a lawyer and a law professor. I'm the academic director of the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic. And the work that I do um, with the government through McHugh and on Mac is a very important part of um, conversations taking part in the province around how we can move forward on anti-racism and anti-racist futures. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you so much for your contribution to all the committees that you sit on with your valuable resources and um, participation. Next, we will hear from Dr. Ismail Torre. Please, Ismail. Thank you very much, Minister Kang. Greetings to everybody. Um, I'm here with a heavy heart. I'm here with sadness, disappointment, indignation. I think we should make space for the body and emotions to speak and not just be thoroughly intellectual with this conversation. This hits home. This hits home for me in uh, more ways than, than one. I'm a settler here in BC in Canada. And so there is a lot of importance that I give to making sure that anti-black racism is also in a conversation and in alignment with such recommendations that come from the TRC, the UNDRIP and other anti-colonial, decolonial indigenous recommendations and our struggles in some ways are similar. But all stand united in fighting COVID and in fighting racism. Next, we have uh, Parliamentary Secretary Ravi Kalan. Ravi? Thank you, Minister. And uh, I want to start off by acknowledging that I am on the traditional uh, territory of the Coast Salish people, the Tuasin, the Muskium, the Katsi, the Kwikwetlam, and the Kwantlen uh, peoples. And uh, um, I just want to echo some of the comments uh, that uh, Dr. Jory just made. Um, and it's been it's been a very hard week uh, weeks um, and uh, and I, I feel that in the words uh, that were just shared and uh, and I think it's important to say that you know Black Lives Matter I think yeah. we shouldn't be afraid of saying that and uh, and you know one of the things that um, my work uh, is uh, you know bring help, helping establish the Human Rights Commission. Um, but in particular, in the last few weeks has been uh, what I've noticed is that uh, as I learn, I realize I don't know enough uh, and I have more learning to do. And I think in the last few weeks in particular, uh, I think I realize and I've been talking to my friends about is our roles 
as people of color to support uh, people in the black community, people in indigenous communities. We have to do more as well um, because uh, anti-black racism is real <laughs> and anti-indigenous anti uh, racism is real. And so we have more to do. And, uh, and so today I, I look forward to learning uh, and listening to the, the panel. Thank you so much, Ravi. And I also want to acknowledge the wonderful work that Ravi has done in re-establishing the BC Human Rights Commission here in British Columbia and all the work that the community has been doing. Um, so now we will begin to uh, with the questions that we have received from the people and communities throughout our province. And um, so our first question I'm going to start off with uh, Paul. So Paul asked, what's the difference between anti-racism and not racist? And I think this question will be uh, best um, directed to Dr. Ismail Traore or Patricia Kakarka. Which one of you would like to start first? Patricia, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so at the end of the day, um, you know, it's a great it's a great question. Let's just start there. And the idea that um, that anti-racism is something that we can all work towards, I think, is an important point to make first and foremost. Um, anti-racism is, of course, um, not not a singular thing. It is a number of strategies that come together to help combat the ways in which racism and I would add, um, in echoing Dr. Torrey's words from the beginning, colonialism um, are, are an everyday part of the fabric of our society. And in doing anti-racist work, we are looking at the ways that racism has historically operated and continues to operate in the present and taking that, um, taking that apart and looking at how it affects the structures and the systems that we live in, how it informs the work of the institutions that are a part of society and also and really importantly are a part of our everyday interactions and to be to be not racist in a world that is informed by by racism by um, racialization i think is a task that um that we're all working on every day in lots of different ways mm -hmm. um but anti-racism is anti-racism and anti colonial anti-racism is a strategic and um, sort of educational learning process that, that we all have to engage in as we move forward. Um, adding on to what you, you just said, Patricia, thank you so much. I, I would say there's a, there's a great analogy that um, Dr. Beverly Tatum has created called the conveyor belt analogy. And here she, she starts off with the premise that racism is so ingrained in society that if you don't do anything, we will still have racial disparities. And she, she says, imagine you are in a walkway at the airport. The active racist behavior is, is the same as walking fast on the conveyor belt because you have identified so much with the ideology of the hegemonic racial order, and you're moving and actively contributing to racism. Mm -hmm. Now, the non-racist is what she calls the passive racist behavior. This is a person who's on the walkway and just standing still, right? The person is not overtly or intentionally involved in racist act, intentionally discriminating, but because yeah. conveyor belt and, and racial disparities is so ingrained in society, that to not do something, you are contributing to the preservation of the system. Yes. Now, the anti-racist is obviously the person on the walkway who is walking faster than the speed of the walkway, but the other direction. Um, and, and, and that to me is, 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 is why there, is a, there, there tends to be the saying that it's uncomfortable to do anti-racism because you're exerting a lot of effort yeah. against the natural flow of the walkway. And so if I had to define anti-racism, I will say there are two dimensions. The first dimension of anti-racism is, is a stance of non-compliance. It is a stance where you are taking an opposition, where you're saying no to something. And here that dimension is anti-racism is any behavior, thought, activity um, that disinvests, that delegitimizes and puts an end to the harm that falls upon racialized people and that puts an end and delegitimizes um, any, any practices that leads to racial disparities in, in outcomes, outcomes such as employment rate, 
uh, morbidity, strict checks, you name it. The second dimension of it is because there is there is this false idea that anti-racism is only anti, but there's mm. actually a dimension of anti-racism that is affirmative. It's an affirmative stance. It says yes to something. And in this case, um, anti-racism is any practice that legitimizes, invests in, and cultivates and contributes to the well-being of racialized people and the equilibrium or the closing of the gaps in the key social indicators. Um, so that is what, it, it to me, it means to be an anti-racist. To be a non-racist is defined by the absence of being racist. To be an anti-racist is defined by the presence of doing anti-racist work. Thank you so much, Dr. Torre. That's a very thoughtful, um, thoughtful comment. Certainly, when we are talking about racism and anti-racism, action and inaction plays a huge role in how we um, are standing in unity and are providing comfort um, and also um, being very encompassing for everyone. So thank you so much. Um, the next question we have, uh, we've received a lot of questions about stronger education on the history of racism. And here's a question received online. When would we introduce a full curriculum in the schools to teach about black history in British Columbia? Um, I would like to invite uh, MLA Kalan to answer this question. Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad you came to me because I think uh, Dr. Choro would say that uh, not soon enough. Uh, and, uh, and so what I would think, I think the answer to the person who asked that question is that um, first, I want to give a big credit to the uh, BC Community Alliance uh, for their advocacy uh, on this issue and wanting to um, expand the education that's in our education system. Um, I've met with them uh, early this year uh, when they were starting their campaigns and uh, they've done a fantastic job. So I'm, I'm really heartened uh, to hear the Minister Fleming uh, wrote to them recently and said, uh, yes, we need to find ways to uh, expand the curriculum. There is some uh, uh, components in the curriculum, but, um, you know, it's not nearly uh, telling the story that needs to be told. Uh, and, uh, you know, example I was sharing with the panel before um, uh, before we came live was my son and I were watching uh, the Feminist Deliverer uh, panel that was up last week with uh, some amazing speakers. And I had my son watch it with me. Uh, and then uh, after about half an hour, he was tuning out and we went for a walk. And my partner said to him, uh, what did you learn? Um, and he said, you know, I didn't know that there was slavery in Canada. And I thought to myself, you know, A, I'm so glad that he picked up on that. Um, and but B, we have to do a better job of, uh, of educating our young people because, uh, you know, that is the future. So um, I, I think uh, I'm excited uh, that there's going to be a collaboration to help put this curriculum together. And uh, and I think it can't come soon enough. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can I quickly give oh, a I want to just I, you, I want to give a shout out to um, the Board of Education in Richmond, which as of yesterday, unanimously voted to advocate to the Ministry of Education, to Minister uh, Rob Fleming for Black History instruction um, and, and Black History uh, to be part, to be mandatory in schools. And they also decided that they would like to create an anti-racism working group um, in order to develop strategies within all schools within the, the, the district. And so I encourage local school boards to take the lead uh, to create a coalition, advocate to the ministry and the minister of Fleming to to pull an anti-racism and also a Black history um, curriculum, and and I believe the ministry as well should take leadership on it, just the same way that they took leadership when it came to SOGI, the the sexual orientation and gender identity, to have that included in in BC curriculum. Definitely, thank you so much. Um, we have so many questions that we received online, so I'm going to just move on to my next question. Uh, Jesse asks, during the West Suetan land protectors protests, our provincial government sided with the RCMP trying to remove First Nations people from their land. How can you condemn racism from our residents while continuing to disregard First Nations rights? This yeah. is a really difficult question, but um, uh, MLA Ravi Kalan, uh, can I invite you to answer this question? Yeah, yeah, no, that is a, it is a tough question, but... Uh, this is uh, if this if talking about racism doesn't make you uncomfortable, then uh, then you're not having the right conversation. And so 
Um, I appreciate the question from the person. Um, I think uh, first I want to acknowledge that it was uh, traumatic for many people, uh, you know, um, the scenes on the television and um, it was traumatic for me. I can't even imagine uh, for uh, Indigenous and First Nations communities. And, and uh, I think, you know, when, when I look at the core of the issue is I spent a lot of time uh, studying this and, and listening to my friends who uh, shared with me their experiences. I think that we have to acknowledge that one of the core issues goes to the Indian Act. Uh, and, uh, you know, we talk about systemic racism, we talk about racism within our system. Uh, you know, that is a, a poster child legislation uh, designed to destroy uh, uh, First Nations governance structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the origin of the conflict, um, it, it comes from that source. And, uh, and you know, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, in Canada, until we have action to start addressing that, uh, it's going to be hard for us to start moving forward, which we need to do. And so uh, I'm very positive about the uh, DRIPO legislation. I know I've had people message me, uh, especially during the, the, uh, the challenge time that we went through uh, with the Wasoatin, um, and it, people were saying, well, drip was dead and, uh, you know, uh, that it's not, it's not can't go forward. And I would say that uh, it's proof that we need it more than ever. Uh, that, that is a tool that's been created, co-developed with First Nations and Indigenous communities uh, to help us move forward. Um, and, we, and the work is critically important. And so we need to find ways to uh, uh, continue down this path. Uh, we need to find ways to address these issues. And we can't avoid these tough questions. We have to have them because it's the only way we're going to be able to address it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, P.S. Uh, Kalan. Uh, definitely, um, when we are talking to the Premier, he has great passion to make sure that the voices of Indigenous people, the voices of First Nations are heard. And this is such a complex issue, but one thing that we can be really proud of as British Columbians is that we are the first province to include the uh, United Nations of Declaration of Indigenous People into our legislation. And we have the utmost sincerity to be working with all First Nations in British Columbia. So thank you so much for your remarks. Question number four uh, is received uh, by Corey. And Corey asks, what changes will be made to the role of our police officers? Um, and what do they have, sorry, what will be made, what changes will be made to the role our police officers have within our community, especially when it comes to our most vulnerable populations like the homeless or mentally ill? many of which are part of a minority group, is it even appropriate for a police officer with no mental health education background or cultural awareness training to be handling this type of situations? Um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ismail Torre to answer this question. This is a, it's an interesting conversation that we're having um, in the public right now. And frankly, I, I would like to start off by saying that over the decades, we've seen neoliberal capitalism, austerity measures um, leading to the defunding of education, leading to the defunding of social, social security, leading to the defunding of healthcare, and many other types of social systems have been defunded. And I think now it's also the time to, to have a conversation about how these systems that lead to social equity, and we know there's a positive relationship between social equity and well-being. And so these institutions, these social security measures that have been defunded by neoliberal capitalism need to be refunded. Data, data is very clear. And, and with the police, I think it's, it's, it's not surprising that um, over time as a result of the defunding of a lot of these institutions, uh, the police has been seen as a department or a solution to address such things as poverty. So that's why we talk about, you know, the criminalization of, of poverty, um, the criminalization of people who are homeless. I know, for example, in Kelowna, uh, even the ways that they go about making benches in the park is to prevent homeless people from sleeping on these benches. So we criminalized, we've, we've allowed the police it's almost like we've taken social issues and said the police can address it. And so I, I'm all for reforming deeply, radically 
the police. And I think um, there is a lot of examples on how we can go about doing that. But one of the things that I would like to see is increasing the credits that is required or the time and education that is required to be a police to be a police officer. I think right now they only need uh, 30 credits to get a, a four year undergraduate. You need 120 credits. And so they only do, um, I don't know, like a year in order to then be able to be uh, police officers. I think that that's not enough. We need to increase the amount of time. They're, they're, they, they receive education so they can learn all these other important things that we're trying to downstream into training. Training is not enough. There has to be a deep, longer time spent um, learning about the ins and outs of police. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Torore. And this, uh, this conversation requires a lot more time and in-depth look, uh, perhaps uh, conversations with RCMP, VPD and different, diff different uh, police departments. But certainly, um, we really um, want to thank you for, for your uh, intake in this. Um, our next question is someone who uh, wishes to remain anonymous. Um, the question is, when is it safe to speak up about your experience as a minority in the workplace without suffering the consequences? And for this question, I would like to invite Patricia to answer. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna start by um, prefacing what I'm gonna say with um, the fact that it's not legal advice. Um, <laughs> as a lawyer, it's always important to, to indicate that. Um, but there are, of course, um, legal mechanisms that you can engage if you're in a work Place and you're experiencing discrimination, harm, harassment, um, or, or a toxic work environment. Um, and those, those legal tools um, may hopefully find you the remedies that you're seeking. Um, sometimes they don't, right? And that's a fact. Um, but I think all of that goes, goes far away from the question of safety, because legal mechanisms, um, in fact, don't always keep us safe at all. Um, you know, in in a, in a system where we have systemic and structural racism and colonialism built into our legal structures and tools, um, policies and practices, those, those systems can sometimes be um, incredibly harmful in and of themselves. And the process of going through them can be um, exacerbating of the harms that you initially experience. So I think that, I think that it's a really difficult question because it's a really um, difficult thing to say that it, it may not be safe. It may not be safe to actually come forward with the discrimination and harassment that you're experiencing um, unless you have a really good support system. And even when you do, I mean, we see it over and over again, right? Cultures of racism exist within workplaces, within institutions, within our structures. And so I, I just want to really emphasize that this idea of safety and the creation of safety um, happens when you when you work in an environment where there is a an anti-racist strategy in place, right? When you have an anti-racist working group, when you potentially have an ombud person that you can go to who is meant to uh, assist you in that advocacy and be your representative. Um, so, I think that it's it's a good thing to get advice about. Um, whether that's legal advice or whether that's um, advice in terms of support for what those structures look like and, and to have supports in place when you move forward so that you can feel as safe as possible as you enter into a conversation that may in fact, um, may in fact be deeply difficult and harmful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, as well, I um, just want to let everyone know that we do have a provincial program that is up and running. It is our Resilience BC uh, Network Program. And this program will be connecting 40 different communities to, to a hub that is a uh, Works, uh, uh, Victoria Immigration and Refugee Center Society. And so as Patricia has said, sometimes coming forward to speak to people in authority may not be the best place but perhaps a nonprofit organization or some place that is in your community that you have a relationship with, or there is no um, conflict of interest that you can come forward and talk about it. As well, I want to direct everyone to our resiliencebcnetwork.ca. Um, inside this, uh, this uh, website, there will be a lot more uh, answers or programs or uh, issues that you may look into. So I 
just wanted to point to everyone a resource that is out there. Uh, this is a new program that uh, the government has put up just uh, yesterday. So this is in its birthing stages. Please visit often because information as it's needed and as, as it is um, uh, requested by the community will be put up um, by our Hubs and Spokes Resilience BC program. So next to our, uh, our next question. Our next question is from Amelia. Amelia asks, some people have been suggesting that we should not be contacting police if we experience or witness racist incidents because the act of contacting police can be harmful to certain communities, particularly Black and Indigenous communities. And that by contacting police, we are actually participating in the oppression of some communities. Um, I was wondering, Dr. Ismail, um, what is your response to this? I, I think it, it's, it's a great question and, and you can go either way, but I, I would like to not, hmm, I think I can't say yay or nay. You know, there's, there, there is a third space that is not based on this dichotomy of whether I should call the police or not. In fact, I think this question highlights the fact that we need additional um, uh, infrastructures or, or organizations or professionals that we can call upon, that racialized people can call upon if they are victims of racial violence, if there are survivors of racial violence. There needs, you know, like not everything has to be criminalized. And the way as well that uh, racism is defined by the police and it tends to be, you know, it has to be overt, it has mm -hmm. to be intentional, um, there are many other forms of racism that do not meet this very specific type of criteria, criteria, but are just as impactful and harmful. And so we need to literally create a wraparound service to support survivors of racism. Um, we need to start to think outside of a punitive, uh, you know, paramilitary policing system in order to support people who are victims of, of violence. So I, I, I can't say yeah or nay. I, all I can say is that this question highlights that um, we need additional resources, such as social workers, uh, psychologists and therapists who, who have a background and a practice in anti-oppression um, and, and, and anti-racism in the lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asmael. Certainly, this is not a very easy conversation to have. Um, but being able to trust in our authorities, whether it's the police or the government or your community hubs and spokes resilience program, um, this is one that everyone will be struggling with in the next little bit. But I'm hoping that the community will come together in unity to be supportive for each other. That's very important, so thank you. Um, the next question is from CJ. And CJ is wondering, how do you recommend responding to racist comments and dialogue when commenters just say they are exercising their rights to uh, the freedom of speech? Um, this question, maybe MLA uh, Kalan, would you like to take this question? Yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I did a consultation last summer uh, traveling through the province uh, on this topic of racism. Uh, and, uh, and this topic comes up uh, a lot, you know, uh, for example, uh, I said Black Lives Matter and, you know, often people respond with, well, all lives matter. Well, you know what? Yes, of course, we know all lives matter. But, you know, right now we're saying Black Lives Matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got a crisis uh, that is in front of us and uh, we need to be able to be comfortable to acknowledge that. Uh, because if we can't even acknowledge that, how are we going to start addressing this, <laughs> the core issues that we have? And so... Um, you know, I think, um, I think it, it does lead to a bigger question around how do we have these conversations of uh, racism? Uh, you know, we, we, we have to try to create some safe spaces for people to have them, but we have to also acknowledge that it's not a safe conversation. Uh, and if you're not feeling uncomfortable, uh, then you're probably not addressing the issues. And so... Um, you know, what I would say to, uh, to folks is that we need to find ways to, um, to engage with people, to have these conversations. People need to take some time and learn uh, and, uh, and read. I, I said it early on, uh, I myself don't know enough. Uh, and so I, I try to uh, educate myself on it. I still not write uh, all the time, but, uh, but I'm, I'm engaged. I think we need more of that in our society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, MLA Kalan. Um, I would like to ask Patricia to share her thoughts as well. 
Thank you. Um, well, I think that the sort of free speech, um, hate speech deb debate is one that we've seen a lot of um, in the news, in, um, in the social sort of medias, as it were. Um, but really, at the end of the day, one of the things that um, I spoke with Dr. Torrey about earlier, um, and in our conversation, we, we had a, a really great conversation where one of the things he talked about was, why is free speech the ultimate goal? Right. And in saying that, you know, um, we went on to discuss how at the end of the day, accountable and responsible speech, respectful speech, respectful engagement ought to be our goal instead. And so I think that, again, if somebody is engaging in racist comments and dialogue, um, asking them to stop, telling them that you think that they're being racist is really important, um, but not engaging this idea around free speech, because at the end of the day, it's, it's not it's probably not um, contributing to the kind of dialogue that we want to be having to move things forward and do the work of um, actively engaging in anti-racist work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, so our half hour mark uh, is now up. And, and uh, thank you so much to the 300 questions that we received uh, on online um, that was received previously. So now we're going to look into online uh, people who are sending questions and we have a lot of questions here today. Um, I would like to direct the first question to MLA Kalan. The question is from Lydia. Lydia asks, is the government ready to address systemic racism in a systemic way? It's time to fund and create a systemic approach to end racism. Yeah, um, thank you. I think Lydia was the person who asked Lydia. the question. Um, uh, thank you for the question. And, uh, you know, uh, we've been having conversations at the uh, MAC uh, when I was uh, there in the previous role uh, on this, but I've been having conversations with my colleagues within government. And, and you know, I think, you know, uh, lately people have been saying, well, you know, we've had across the country premiers now wanting to acknowledge that systemic racism exists. Uh, and Premier Hogan's, I think, the only one that's uh, come out and said, yes, uh, we have uh, racism within our institutions. And so the question, I think, is what is what does that systemic racism look like for me? Um, we know that people, uh, the black, indigenous people of color uh, are uh, the folks who are getting the minimum wage or in the minimum wage jobs. We know that labor laws don't um, uh, support uh, these communities. We know that. Uh, over or the higher number in, in the poverty stats are um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. And so when we know those things, I think one of the critical important ways is to address the inequality, the income inequality and the inequality in society. And so, you know, when, when you address, uh, when you raise minimum wage uh, to make it closer to, to a living wage, I find, I think that's a good way of addressing systemic racism. When you strengthen labor laws, uh, you are taking steps to address systemic racism. Um, but I think, you know, what really needs to help drive this, and, and I give all hats off to the, the folks on the Multicultural Advisory Committee, and they've been advocating nonstop, is we need to start collecting race-based data. Um, because I think that, uh, you know, when you have race-based data, uh, you, you can make the case to the public so the public can see what the challenges are that, and the reasons why we need to address them. And so uh, I give credit to them. I've spoken to the premier about this as well. Uh, many of my colleagues uh, believe that this is the path forward uh, to, uh, to really get into addressing these core issues. Uh, and, uh, and I thank the uh, MAC uh, board members for, for raising this. And I think that when we, if we take that step, um, I think that's the first foundational step to really make a, a big shift in, uh, in uh, addressing systemic racism. I'm not sure if uh, doctors or Patricia might want to jump in and share their thoughts on that. Patricia? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that it's really important to think about income inequality. And um, one of the things that I know is um, happening in terms of federal discussions, of course, is um, the idea of basic minimum income, right? And, um, and whether or not those conversations will happen here as well is, is yet to be seen, so. Thank you. Um, our next question is actually for all of our panelists here. Um, and I will start with Dr. Torore, then Patricia, then Aravi. So Jesse is asking every one of the panel members on your thoughts on defunding the police. Uh, Dr. Ismail Torore. 
Yeah, I, I previously touched upon that. I think there are models um, in, in different places around the world where there has been a reconsideration of what the role of police is in society. Um, you know, the, the, the slogan defunding the police is also part and parcel of a, of a broader movement that is about, um, um, you know, the, the abolition of the prison industrial system. And so I'm, I'm of the idea, for instance, that <clears throat> we definitely need to reconsider the amount of budget that we provide to police forces. I know in Vancouver, about 20 to 21 percent of um, the municipal budget goes to the police and they've been very squeamish just, uh, you know, just when um, uh, the mayor suggested a 1% decrease in their budget, but simultaneously are also acknowledging that they are not the best service in order to address, for example, calls for uh, mental, mental health, mental health uh, intervention and episodes. And so uh, absolutely, there have steps that have been taken in, in Minneapolis and, um, and also, I believe, uh, Los Angeles, where radical steps are in the pre process of being taken to reconsider police policing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for, for defunding the police, but in the conversation about defunding the police is mainly the emphasis of creating other infrastructures and supporting existing um, you know, social services like, you know, uh, why not create free education, for instance? Why not have, um, you know, public tr transit to be cheaper or free? You know, like there, there are many systems that we can make sure become the, the great equalizer of the different types of disparities that we're seeing um, in, in social indicators. So, so this is a conversation about what type of society do we want to see and what approach do we take to address complex adaptive social needs? Do we just criminalize it or do we rise up to the challenge, to the challenge with more sociological ideas? Thank you, Dr. Torre. Uh, next, Patricia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree. Um, defunding the police and abolishing the prison industrial complex are something that, um, that need to happen. And yes, of course, they need to be replaced with, um, with infrastructure that, it, that absolutely supports um, a realignment of our values and a realignment of um, values that are anti-colonial and anti-racist and which are humanizing instead of dehumanizing and which um, allow people to, to prosper and get the supports that they need. Um, specifically, these things need to be, um, need to be community focused and, and the ideas about how to do that need to come from the communities themselves. Um, you know, especially in the case of indigenous communities, certainly there are infrastructures that were in place for millennia and, and time immemorial here in these lands where people knew how to deal with their issues and had laws. And the criminalization of poverty and of mental health and of addictions and of um, well, numerous other um, engagements, public engagements, is is not getting us far at all. Um, so I do think that the, the calls to defund the police and abolish prisons um, is a move in the right direction and that it gives us an opportunity to open a social dialogue about what those new infrastructures should look like as we move into our anti-colonial, anti-racist futures. Thank you for a remark, Patricia. Um, next we have P.S. Kalan. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I don't wanna repeat uh, uh, what uh, my colleagues here have said. Um, uh, they made excellent points, and I think uh, you know it reminds me of a conversation I had with like one of my constituents who uh, wanted to understand what this means. You know, he hears the slogan "defund police," uh, and then when you ask people, uh, "Do you think a police officer is the best person to help someone in, with the mental health issues or under distress?" and the overwhelming answer usually is yes. Uh, and so you know, it's about opening this conversation up for people to understand. What, what, what it is that people are asking for. They're asking for more preventive services. Let, let's not criminalize, let's, let's, let's address these core issues that we have in our society. And, and you know, I, I was actually really heartened because I know the Premier announced this morning that, um, that uh, we're gonna open up the Police Act. Uh, that uh, after 45 years of a police act, times have changed. And uh, you know, he announced that he's gonna strike an all party committee 
to look at the police act and see uh, you know how we can modernize uh, um, our systems and I think uh, I think the time is right and uh, and I you know I look forward to seeing those deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, P.S. Kalan. It's really uh, heartening to know that um, our, our conversations are, are um, moving our legislations proactively forward to the needs of our community. So it's very good to hear that. Um, our next question, we have so many questions online. I'm very happy to see uh, the, the really great discussions we're having here. The next question will be for Dr. Torore. Jasmine asks, teaching Black history is one thing, but what about the inclusion of Black authors in English class or discussion, uh, discussing the works of Black scientists and Black artists in the arts and sciences class? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, we know that Canada or, or multiracial countries, that everybody contributes to um, the development of these countries. Uh, the development of these nation states, and so it is. It is incumbent upon us to know these to know these histories. Uh, one thing, if the, if there is one uh, lesson or you know great impact that we can see from the, the Afrocentric school in Toronto, which is about 10, 11 years um, in its making now, is that uh, the students in this Afrocentric school say that they have a sense of community, a sense that they count, a sense that um, they see themselves as well reflected in the curriculum. It's a very important time for emotional development, social development, self-esteem. And if you're constantly in a space where the people that you see who are who are you know, applauded and given accolades and, and saying are the creators of this and that, um, very, you know, unintentionally, you'll start to develop a sense of, well, what about people who look like me? It's, and there are a lot of studies um, that have been done, uh, you know, for example, the, the, the very famous doll test study where two dolls that are identically, identically, that are identical, but have different, you know, skin tone um, are put in front of children of a certain age. And the researcher asks a very simple question. Who do you think is more intelligent? Who do you think is ugly? Who do you, who do, who do you want to play with the most? And what we see over and over in the, in the doll study, whether it's done you know, 20 years ago or even more recently, five years ago, that uh, the, the majority of, 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 of students um, will associate positive uh, traits with the, the doll that has white skin and negative traits with a doll that has black skin. Mm. And so absolutely, uh, black history, black education, um, you know, black scientists, all of that is important. Thank you. And uh, as well, uh, P.S. Kalan? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to, you know, it, the, the question and, and, and uh, the answer uh, triggered a, a moment for us. Uh, my son was in kindergarten. Uh, he came home, uh, my partner and I picked him up and uh, he said, Dad, uh, I wish uh, I wish I was white. Uh, emotional, um, and uh, and then we started delving into it, uh, and it was a question of well, why would he think this way? And you know, as a child, and children see all the teachers are white. They see all the superheroes. He said all the superheroes are white, uh, and so it, 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 it dawned on us at that time that even us who are very conscious and aware uh, and always talking to our kids about it. Um, have only a certain amount of influence. It, there's other influences that are way stronger for our young people. And, and so uh, I think that the question is fantastic. I think the answer doctor has provided is fantastic. We need to see that because, um, you know, if we want to build strong young people, they need to see the diversity reflected in those who are educating them, uh, those who are, um, uh, those that are uh, in, in their realm and in their, in their world. So, um, so uh, I applaud that question and thank you, doctor, for the answer. Thank you. And it is, it is a diversity that we have in British Columbia and as well all over uh, Canada is what makes us very special is that we're not a melting pot, but we are uh, a mosaic of different cultures that share in its beauty. And that's why I love to be British Columbia. I'm very proud to be calling myself a British Columbian. Um, our next question is for P.S. Kalan. 
um, with all the work that you've been doing in uh, Human Rights Commission, uh, this question is for you. Uh, Sangeeta asks, there is now increasing evidence of police and systemic racism against indigenous people in BC. How does racial equality fit in the human rights framework? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and so I think one of the things we have to um, come to uh, grips with, and I think people are, but uh, the rest of society is catching up. And uh, I think uh, Patricia will be a better position to answer this question. Uh, is that you know the the population, uh, the police, the the policing of people of color, black and indigenous people is uh, is at a higher rate than everywhere else. And you know I know in Ontario, for example, um, the Human Rights Commission um, uh, made uh, had significant reports on uh, car checks uh, and you know getting rid of car checks, uh, also having police track their uh how who they pull over uh and how often and and the data that came out of it was was mind-blowing and so uh you know when we look at indigenous communities uh you know i have traveled uh, in, into the north i've traveled into the interior uh, this is the singular biggest question that comes up and and i know uh, that we have um, a fantastic human rights commissioner uh, who uh, will be looking at this question and she is probably looking at this question uh and because Sometimes uh, the answers to address these issues are not within government. Um, we are thinking about that. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, work being done on, around justice reform um, uh, in our uh, in our system. I know Patricia is uh, very knowledgeable about that, and uh, and so maybe I'll let Patricia answer that because she's got much more information on that than I do. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, um, the I mean. This has come up, obviously, very recently, coming out of um, the report um, written by Ardeth Wacom called Expanding Our Vision, which directly looks at the work of human rights um, tribunal uh, decisions here in Vancouver, uh, sorry, here in BC, and, um, and in fact points to the lack of um, Indigenous identity as something that is um, elucidated in the legislation. And so the work of moving that forward um, is, is taking place, as I understand it. And we are, um, there are considerations about how to best move forward in terms of expanding the scope of the legislation to include ident Indigenous identity, um, which is a move that I think will certainly be helpful. Um, very recently, there was a successful case run by um, some fantastic lawyers and Atira um, called Campbell and the Vancouver Police Board. Um, that's the BC Human Rights Tribunal. The number is uh, 275, it's from 2019. And that's, that's a case where we see very specifically how someone's indigenous identity impacts the way that they are treated and the human rights violations that they, um, that they experience. So this work is important, it's happening right now, and hopefully we'll see that legislation change to include Indigenous identity in a way that will uh, provide for meaningful um, oper operationalization of the Human Rights Tribunal moving forward. I think it's also really important in some of the work that's happening on the advisory board coming out of that report is also to consider just how the process of human rights complaints takes place and um, to look at the education and training of Human Rights Tribunal members. Thank you, Patricia, for uh, sharing your thoughts. Um, this next question is also for all the panelists today. Um, Sharon asks, um, will they make more anti-racism programs for schools and workplace and out in a general public? So anti-racism programs for schools, workplace, and in a general public. And I would like to start with Patricia. Great. Um, I hope so. <laughs> and I think that I think that that's something that the government should be responding to. And if that's what the public um, is willing to fight for, then I think that the government will respond to it. So not to put um, not to put too fine a point on it, but this is exactly what should be happening. Certainly, we need to um, engage in educational campaigns through all institutions about how to change the way that we uh, address anti-colonialism and anti-racism. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to direct uh, the next response to uh, P.S. Callon. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the answer is uh, clear. We, we need more. Um, and, uh, and I think there is a hunger for more. Um, and, uh, and clearly, 
uh, you know, when you have over 10,000 people gather peacefully uh, to demonstrate, uh, there's a desire from the public uh, for this uh, anti-racism training. So I think we need it in schools, uh, both uh, K to 12 in, in, at the university level. Um, you know, I think we need to find ways and provide resources for um, principals and teachers and others as well. And uh, uh, education is the key. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think it's uh, very needed and important. And, uh, and uh, I don't think Dr. Troy will disagree, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that's been raised at our, again, our multicultural advisory committee many times. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Torori? Yeah, um, and just not to reiterate, I will like to say the anti-racism education, anti-racism programs need to also be decolonial. Uh, uh, Bonita, Bonita Lawrence and um, Zainab Amadahi have written a, an amazing article on how sometimes the language of anti-racism um, can uh, reassert um, colonialism, can reassert the assumption that land is still not in contest. And so I will say, absolutely, we need, we need more of it, and, but it needs to be in conversation with um, our you know, indigenous, indigenous thought, indigenous literature, indigenous communities. Thank you. And, and definitely this conversation is for everyone. Um, uh, our, our, our ministry is actually uh, working cross ministries um, with uh, post-secondary, with uh, Rob Fleming and K-12, but with uh, you know, social poverty as well as public safety, this, this topic is not just within the multicultural ministry. And um, there is now a built expectation as we are having our conversations, we're building expectations that it is socially unacceptable to not be, uh, to, to be racist and, and not to be uh, inclusive. So I'm hoping that as we, and everyone engage more and more in conversations and in communication, what is acceptable and what is not. And sometimes I understand that part of it could be ignorance. So education is very important, but as well, speak up, share, share your beautiful culture and make sure that people uh, are, are not accidentally um, being ignorant about certain uh, race or cultures or, or values. And, and so it's up to all of us to really share, but definitely the government is on board. Uh, Resilience BC, our hubs and spokes program will be up and running. Um, it's already up and running, especially with our hubs and works program in Victoria. Um, we will continue to take questions until 4 p.m. So please keep the questions coming. Our next question is um, by Melissa. And this is a question for P.S. Kalan. Melissa asks, how can people running community programs such as sports teams and groups and uh, etc. ensure these programs are being done in an anti-racist way without further imposing on racialized people? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and uh, and thank you to um, to Melissa that asked that question. I'm glad that you're thinking about that, Melissa, um, because uh, you know I I spend my life in sport, and uh, and I believe sport has the power. Um, to transform societies. Uh, I'm passionate about that. And so uh, what I would say is that um, the, the, the best way for your sport club uh, organization is to uh, reach out and get your organization to hire a consultant. Um, you know, there are people uh, that do this work that help build structures, that help educate uh, coaches, um, uh, that, um, you know, you can't expect them to do the work for free. Uh, that's, uh, not on, but there's tons of organizations that do this work. They come in, they work with their coaches, they work with your managers. Uh, they, um, help build the guidelines and frameworks, uh, for your organization. And this is for arts groups. This is for, um, uh, you know, whether you're a government agency or nonprofit. And so, uh, I would say that, um, there's, uh, there's lots of ways to do it. Reach out. Uh, also, uh, a good way is to push your um, your governing sports bodies as well, because uh, you know uh, change doesn't come from the top. The change will come from bottom, and so we need to ensure that you push your governing sports bodies to have that critical lens. And I know that uh, Dr. Torre and Patricia may have thoughts on this as well. Dr. Torre, yeah, I, I would suggest any organization to use a racial equity lens and take a look of the organization, your operation, um, where, where you put your budget, 
who are the stakeholders and right holders you have relationship with in the same way that we have a GBA plus a gender based analysis lens. Um, I strongly recommend that uh, organizations apply a racial analysis lens as well to 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 make sense on how um, how far along the spectrum of being a racially homogeneous all the way to a fully anti-racist organization hmm. it is. Thank you. And um, I notice our hour is almost up, but we have one more question. And um, I would like to invite all panelists to answer this question um, if you have. Um, so Pierre, Pierre asks, how can we get more black and indigenous teachers in public schools? We need more in Port Coquitlam as role models. So I will uh, start with uh, Dr. Tarari. You hire them. <laughs> we hire them, yes, give them opportunities. <laughs> we hire them, they're around. Hire them. And, and, and as well, we, we want to make sure that opportunities there for um, people of all, all colors, uh, but especially mm -hmm. black indigenous people, please apply. Um, our yeah. students need you. Um, oh, they apply. apply. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, they, they're applying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, P.S. Kalan, would oh, you like to oh, go next? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I can summarize it better than Dr. Azori. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, we, we, need to, uh, we need to look at our organizations and, and, and think uh, who's here and who's not here. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, it, it sounds very simple, it's higher them, but it, it is uh, that. And, and it's also creating uh, education and training opportunities. Uh, I know that there's been some recent programs uh, a Ministry of uh, Advanced Education to um, uh, increase the opportunities for educators, especially Indigenous and First Nations uh, educators to get in. And it's also, I think, rethinking our education system. You know, um, I have to say the curriculum change was a big step forward. Uh, the, the recent curriculum change was a big step forward. Um, you know, our kids are, my son, uh, again, I'll use them as an example, but they, they're learning uh, things around First Nations, Indigenous communities that I did not learn until I was 21, 22 years old. Uh, and that's embarrassing for me to say, but uh, it's the truth. And so, uh, you know, the way to change the system, the way to change the education system is by ensuring that the voices, the lived experiences are there in front of the classroom. Um, and uh, it's critically important. So. Definitely. Every teacher brings something different to the conversation into the classroom. Just a wealth of or, um, information. I'm going to invite Patricia to give uh, the last remarks for this question. Thanks. I'm going to take an opportunity here to, to bring us back to systemic issues, right? And to say, yes, we need to hire those teachers, but first we have to get them there, right? We have to, you know, when you say it starts with children, it really does because we have to make sure that our Indigenous, Black, and racialized children are having the same opportunities that other children are having, and that they um, that, that that's happening across not just their educational experience but their home life, right? Mm -hmm. That if they're Indigenous, they're not um, in constant threat of being taken away from their families and their communities. Um, if they're Black, that they're being supported and taken care of, and that they're um, you know that their communities and families whether they're black and indigenous and racialized aren't being criminalized and over policed and that poverty and mental health are being taken care of properly. It all, it's all interconnected, right? And it really starts with providing those institutional and systemic um, supports that make sure that everyone is given um, equitable opportunities. Hmm. And if I can just really emphasize on what Patricia is saying, the systemic part is absolutely important. Look, um, uh, you know, I was kind of kind of being a little bit tongue in cheek when I was saying hire them, but we are applying. But there's one thing we need to take into consideration, reevaluate, which is the criteria for becoming a tenured professor or a professor. Is are we going to put a lot of emphasis on how many publications have you done, how many courses have you taught? What is common amongst racialized faculty is that they spend a lot of time supporting racialized students. They spend a lot of time working in the community racial equality, gender equality, you name it. But the university does not take that into consideration as important public education work. It still does the predominant focusing on how many publications have you done, which are criteria that stem from when the university was created as, as, as a place that only white men belong into. And so we have to reevaluate the criteria and we have to make it such that when they do apply, they would like to stay because a lot of people are also leaving because of the different forms of racism that exist within 
the, 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 the universities. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you for all your thoughtful comments. Um, so that is all the time that we have left in this town hall. So in closing, it has been a privilege to be your moderator today. And I hope this time was an opportunity to learn from each other and build on each and every one of our understanding. As minister responsible for multiculturalism, I'm going to take away all that I've heard today um, and I'm gonna forward this to our government to help inform our decisions and the directions that we are going to um, in the future. Today's session was recorded and will be posted on YouTube for others to be able to view in the future. When it comes to fighting racism, we know there is much more work and we are absolutely committed to doing this work. So once again, uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for all of your insights and for taking the time to answer the questions from all the people across the province. And as well, uh, a very big hand to say everyone uh, who submitted a question today and for joining us for this virtual town hall. It is this participation or constant communication, questions, answers, asking them, even when they are critically hard, um, awkward, challenging, we need to have these conversations. And absolutely, our government is moving in a very proactive and bold direction in fighting racism and hate. Everyone in British Columbia deserves to live in a place where it is safe for them. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you to everyone and have a good evening. Thank you.